All right, good morning, good morning, everyone. <laughs> I am happy to be here. I'm happy that we're starting this study in Mark. Um, when I was a kid, when I was in, in school, I'm sure you guys probably remember this as well, when you'd line up at recess or line up for an activity or you know, in gym class or something, you, you'd see the, the teacher starts counting group A, group B, group C, and so you gotta position yourself to, you know, so you're on, you're on your friend's team. And when I found out that we were doing a study on Mark, I'm like, well, I had to position myself. So Gannon does the introduction, so I get to talk about John the Baptist. So <laughs> and then Vincent wasn't there at the meeting, or at the, when that was being assigned. So I took the, I took the good spot. We're going to talk about John the Baptist today and <clears throat> to see what Mark has to say about him. Um, but... Uh, I had to position myself in the right spot because to talk about my favorite, one of my favorite people in the Bible, the last Old Testament prophet who we read about in the New Testament, John the Baptist. <laughs> um, there's a lot going on here and there's, I could talk all day about it, but I'm going to stick to, um, I'm just going to go verse by verse and while I talk about it, I'm going to talk about three, three key aspects of, this is Mark 1 verses 1 through 8, well 2 through 8, we'll say 1 though 2, we'll read that one. Um, we're going to talk about three key aspects of this passage. The first is, what did the Old Testament say about John the Baptist? Or why did John the Baptist have to come in the first place? Who was, who was John the Baptist and what significance does his ministry have to do with Jesus' ministry? And then, last of all, the application, what does this have to do with me? So, I'll start on one one the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and Jerusalem were, <laughs> were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we, we thank you for your grace and your mercy, Lord. Lord, we thank you that, that you gave us this day that we can set aside for you, Lord, that we can rest, that we can study your word, that we can worship you. Lord, I pray that... Uh, I pray that you would speak through your word, Lord. I pray that, that, that you would decrease me and that you would increase, Lord. Lord, I pray for, for everyone here that, that, hears, that hears this message, Lord. I pray that it would, it would help them to live a life of humility and repentance. Lord, we pray that you would continue to conform us into the image of your dear son, Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. So Mark starts us off so I'm going, to, I'm going to start off in verse 2, even though we read verse 1. Um, but he start, in verse 2, he starts us off with a quote that he attributes to Isaiah. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. But if you look this quote up, if you look the, up the quotation, you'll see that it's actually a mixed quotation, merging Exodus 23.20, Malachi 3.1, and Isaiah 43. So let's take a moment to talk about those verses. In Exodus 23, 20, it says, Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the, on the way and bring you to the place that I have prepared. This is the part in Exodus where God is promising the conquest of the, of the promised land to his people. It's also important to, to note here that when Moses uses the word angel and John Mark uses the word messenger, those words can be used interchangeably in this case. At least that's what the people who are way smarter than me and have published books have said. 
Um, but in this context, they can be used interchangeably. And what we can gather from the context of, of John the Baptist is that God promises to send an angel, a messenger, a herald, one to proclaim the news ahead of the Israelites in the wilderness. And then the other, the other part of this is Malachi 3.1. The second part of this amalgamation, it reads, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And if you were to turn the page over in, in Malachi, over to 5 and 6, we'll see that this messenger that, that the Lord is revealing to Malachi is Elijah. We can know from 2 Kings 2.11 that Elijah didn't die a normal death like, like most men, but he was carried up to heaven in a whirlwind. And so God's saying, he's going to come, Elijah's going to come back. Now understand, we're only in chapter 1 right now, but we'll get, <laughs> we're going to talk about it a little bit now, a little bit later, and a whole lot more when we get to chapter 9. But Jesus will tell us in chapter 9 that, that John the Baptist is not a literal reincarnation. He's not... You know, the same DNA as Elijah. He didn't say DNA there, but he's not the same person as Elijah, but he's the eschatological, the end fulfillment of Elijah, where he's preparing the way for Yahweh, who is coming. I'll stick a pin in that for now and circle back in a few minutes, though, because, because the overlaps between Elijah and John the Baptist are really interesting. The quote in Mark 1-2 and Malachi uh, 3.1 is also ever so slightly adjusted, where my way becomes your way. And this is so Mark is able, Mark implies that Jesus is the, is the Messiah and the embodiment of Yahweh himself. The last part of this quote that's merged together, the flagship, if you will, is Elijah, uh, <laughs> is Isaiah, is Isaiah 43. It says, a voice cries in the, a voice cries, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And this is in the midst of a very powerful messianic passage. It predicts a new exodus. It predicts a new exodus where Yahweh would return and triumphantly lead his people out of Babylonian exile and lead them to the, the promised land, lead them back to the promised land. And if we look how John is described, he's preaching in the wilderness, specifically the Judean desert. So John Mark is saying that John the Baptist is the fulfillment, God's messenger, a voice in the desert shouting out to God's people that the Messiah is coming. Instead of an exodus from Egypt or Babylon, John the Baptist is talking about a perfect exodus where God will restore his people and dwell with them. But this is three different verses. So did Mark get confused? These, did, he, did he think that Isaiah said what Malachi said and what Moses said? I, I don't think so. Um, but maybe, maybe, since Mark is the shortest of the Gospels, maybe he was just trying to save some space and just said Isaiah. But aside from that theory that I just proposed, I have no evidence to support that either. <laughs> so um, I was reading a book by uh, Mark Strauss about about Mark's gospel, and I like his perspective of the quotation where he says, Mark is affirming that the beginning of the gospel represents the fulfillment of Isaiah's broader version of eschatological restoration and renewal. It is like the beginning of a new exodus where God's people are delivered from the hands of nations and journeying exiles to their home and eventual arrival in Jerusalem, the place of God's presence. It happened first, in end quote. It happened first in Exodus. God promised it to Malachi. But God so clearly articulated it at length through his prophet Isaiah. The, on, the only Old Testament book more quoted in the New Testament than Isaiah is Psalms. So if you're ever taking a Bible quiz and someone in the New Testament is quoting someone in the Old Testament and you don't know where that quotation is, if you just want to guess, the best answer is Psalms and then Isaiah. So... <laughs> that's, that's got nothing to do with this, with this account in Mark, but it's, it's practical advice. That's what I tell my kid. <laughs> so it's a, there's also a type of word picture that, that we don't really see in our day-to-day -day interactions. Um, we might see a picture of it 
at uh, like Windsor Castle in England where the guys with the tall hats are marching around with swords, make way for the king's guard. You know, we don't really see that very much, but in the days of the, Ro especially in the days of the Roman Empire, when the king or the governor or someone, or the Caesar or the governor, or someone on behalf of, of a very important person, when they're going to a specific place, they would send someone ahead of them and make, make way. They would announce that the king is coming or, you know, insert other title here. The king is coming, make way. They would make sure that there's not people milling about in the middle of the roads. The people wanted to see their monarch pass by. The monarch didn't want to step, o you know, step over a donkey lying in the road or something like that. So he would send someone on, on his behalf. They would send heralds, messengers ahead of them to make the way. And these people, um, an, a, a, an example of this um, that I do see in my day-to-day -day life, or that I did, past tense, was um, before I moved out here, I was, I was in the Marine Corps. I worked with naval aviation. I was a paper pusher, but lots and lots of, you know, responsible for lots and lots of documenting maintenance. I don't remember if it was every year or every other year, the uh, commander of Naval Air Forces would send an inspection team to make sure that we're doing things by the book. They've got, they gave us a checklist. Um, they gave us a checklist to make sure that we're keeping up with the prescribed standards. It was an open book test. They wanted to make sure that we didn't have the guy that had no security clearance, three DUIs, and no experience fixing planes with duct tape and bubble gum. Um, so when these inspectors were coming, they would look at our records, they would look at how we're performing the maintenance. They weren't, you know, they weren't inspecting our uniforms, they weren't inspecting the facilities, but that was part of the preparation for this inspection. You know, the people on behalf of Commander Naval Air Force is, is showing up. We're gonna wash the walls. You know, we're going to make sure there's no extra rocks in the parking lot, things of that nature. So while we didn't have heralds, we wanted, we wanted to be prepared for these inspector, inspectors the moment, from the moment that they got out of, their, out of their parking lot or out of their car in the parking lot on Monday to when they left at the end of their inspection on Friday. And this is what John's doing. He's preparing Israel for the Messiah. Rather than, but rather than taking a pair of scissors and a ruler out to the grass, or I guess he's in the Judean desert, so instead of raking raking the sand in neat patterns, John's doing something significantly more important. After laying the foundation for, for who John is and the big picture of God's special revelation in Scripture, in verses 2 and 3, we start to learn exactly who John is and what he was doing. So let's talk about John the Baptist. We saw that he was foretold in Isaiah, so let's talk about him. Specifically, who was John the Baptist and what significance does he have with Jesus' ministry? Well, we're in um, Mark 1. Right now we're in verse 4. Mark 1, 4. As a Baptist, of course, I would be remiss if, it, if I did not include the perennial joke that it's John the Baptist. It's not John the Papist or John the Presbyterian or John the Methodist. We get to claim him. He's ours. <laughs> so now that that's out of the way and I've made my cheesy joke, uh, John the Baptist is paving the way for Christ's ministry and therefore intentionally designed to be overshadowed by Christ. John was a prophet. He was a herald going ahead of Jesus to prepare the way for him. And whether it's here in Mark or in the other Gospels or even in the book of Acts, we can see that the, the writers make it clear that the scriptures point to John the Baptist's ministry as is being seen as the beginning of the gospel, of the good news. And the authors seek to connect Jesus' public ministry with John the Baptist's. John the Baptist's ministry started, according to verse 4, in the wilderness. Mark is straight to the point. My translation, I'm reading out of the ESV, it says that John appeared. The King, the King James skips that and just said John did baptize. His origin story gets a lot... in gets a lot more detail uh, in Luke 1, for instance, starting, or I'm not saying, starting in Luke 1, but Mark's emphasis, Mark's emphasis doesn't really need John's background information. He gets straight to the point. He gets straight to the wilderness because that's where the new exodus was. Israel wandered through the wilderness 
Coming home from the Babylonian captivity, Israel wandered through the wilderness. John the Baptist is starting. Mark is talking about John the Baptist's ministry starting, in effect, in the wilderness. In the wilderness, Moses escaped to, to es escape from the Egyptians. And that's where God first, he first encountered God. So Mark sets up his account of John the Baptist as the voice in the wilderness. And if we are curious about some of the details, it, the Bible doesn't say exactly where he was in the wilderness, but we know he was baptizing people from Jerusalem and Judea in the River Jordan. So it was probably somewhere north of the River Jordan where the, Jor the river meets the Dead Sea. I'm going to read 4 through 8 again, and then we'll talk about this baptism of repentance. Mark 1, 4. John appeared, baptizing the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and Jerusalem were going out, <laughs> every time, were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the River Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey and preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am unworthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. What is this baptism of repentance that, that he's talking about? We know that it's something that you, that, that's unique in John the Baptist's time, when, when Gentiles would become, would convert to Judaism, they would have some sort of a ceremonial washing. I think it's called like a quorum, quorum? That's not quorum. It sounds similar to quorum. I couldn't pronounce it. But there was some sort of a ceremonial washing. But we know it, it wasn't that because it said John the Baptist was baptizing them. And when you would, if you were converting to Judaism, you'd dip yourself in the water. We also know that, you know, from later on in the scriptures, in, 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 in Acts, we see they encounter people that received John the Baptist's baptism, but they didn't, re they didn't receive the baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So we know that John's baptism isn't the same as Jesus' baptism either. It was something that was unique. But it would be reasonable to conclude that, that this, this aspect of this Jewish baptism, you know, not quite baptism, uh, that, that was connected to it. People would be familiar with it. It wasn't something that was completely alien to the people of Jerusalem and Judea. But it's important to stress that it is a new practice. And it's also important to bring up that the word baptism is one of those Greek words that is transliterated rather than translated. We didn't really have a word for it, so we just modified the original Greek word baptizo and variants thereof to baptism, to baptize. It means to immerse, to dunk, to fully put into water. I don't think, from many of the context clues that I've gathered in my reading, I don't think it means to pour, gently sprinkle, or from the viral picture from the beginning of the pandemic, to squirt from across the room with a squirt gun. <laughs> we talked about baptism as the part of, uh, the, ba the baptism is part of the baptism of repentance. So this baptism of repentance is part of this baptism. It means that the baptism symbolizes and so publicly announces the act of repentance. Repentance doesn't just mean feeling sorry or feeling bad about what was done, though a repentant person may surely experience those feelings. Repentance is more than this. Repentance is a change of an attitude and an action you know, the, the word picture that, that would be used in, in the original Greek, from, from what I understand, it means like to change direction. So it's like, if I'm going to, this would be me repenting in action, right? I'll be walking this way, and I repent, and I go this way, or not that way. I could go this way, or the, you know, whatever. To change, to change course, if, if, you were, if you were navigating. So in the case of John's baptism, to narrow it down a little bit more, it would also carry a sense of returning to God and reorienti reorienting their life in submission to him. John's baptism isn't just talked about in the Gospels. There, there's, even, there's even secular, uh, not secular, but there's non-Christian sources. The, the historian Josephus, 
He was, he was a Jewish historian. He hung out with the Romans. He was there when the Romans destroyed the second temple in 70 AD. And he writes about John the Baptist. <clears throat> um, he talks about his practice of baptism, noting, quote, it was, uh, or it was, quote, used not to gain pardon for whatever sins they committed, but as purification of, of the body, implying that the soul was already thoroughly cleansed by righteous conduct. Now, the words of Josephus aren't inspired. He wasn't even a Christian. But it is an interesting contemporary account of John's ministry. Along with what the scriptures say about baptism, we can clearly see that it wasn't the baptism in and of itself that did anything, but rather it was a public and outward expression of an inward repentance. Lastly, on this baptism of repentance, I think it's fair to say that Mark was using hyperbole when he says all the country of Judea and Jerusalem were being baptized and confessing their sins. It wasn't a small number, though. John the Baptist was causing something of a stir in the area. People knew that God was doing something, and they were coming down to see what sort of revival this wild man in the wilderness was doing. When it talks about John the Baptist's garments, and that's one that always stood out to me ever since I was a kid. You know, he wore camel's hair and a belt, right? John the Baptist had, as what the kids might say, some serious drip. He had an impressive sense of fashion. In verse 6, we see that he wears the garment of camel's hair secured with a leather belt, and he had an interesting diet, one that I'm not too keen on giving a try, namely wild honey and locusts. This was not, however, John's attempt to make straight the path, but to prepare the way for high fashion and a new fad diet. <laughs> um, it demonstrates that he was living the life of an aesthetic prophet. If you talk about someone who's eating locusts and wild honey, it means that they're living off the land, living a hard life without the nice things of the city and, and the palace, despite being God's prophet. That's right, that's right, no steak. Locust steak. <laughs> if, if you ever touched or, or handled hair or fabric made from camel's hair, um, it's not comfortable. Think of the poorest, cheapest quality wool sweater that you've ever had and make it twice as bad. And then you're kind of in the neighborhood of what this guy was wearing. The shirt was itchy as all get out. And more importantly, it wasn't even an original fashion choice. In 2 Kings uh, chapter 1, verse 8, Elijah, who is, we said was John's typological fulfillment, he wore a garment of hair and a leather belt as well. He's dressed up just like Elijah. With this choice of the mixed prophecies in Malachi 3, 1 and 4, 6, about Elijah being the messenger of the Messiah, we can see why people, or why Mark would emphasize these things and why people of the day would make the connection asking if John the Baptist is Elijah. When I said John's ministry was intended to be overshadowed by Christ, we can see this most clearly in verses 7 and 8, where it says, And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The unstrapping, the untying of sandals, what, what John's talking about there, in the tradition of the day, it was such a low duty that was reserved exclusively for slaved, slaves. Even in the Talmud, it says the disciple of a rabbi must do everything must do for the rabbi everything that a slave would do except the removing of shoes. This is, it's, it's the lowest of the low. So we see, the, we see the humility and we see John going out of his way to make sure that people aren't going to follow him. They, he's, he's pointing them, he's pointing them to Christ. Um... And then there was a small rabbit hole that I went down. I'm not going to go into great detail about it now, but there was this rabbit hole that I went of people were talking about how John the Baptist, um, people who deny that Jesus is the Christ would say that, that Jesus just co-opted John's ministry. He's like, oh, someone's baptizing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something similar um, and try and make it appear that, that John was just some wild aesthetic in the wilderness but not only did he identify himself, in the, according to Scripture, not only did he identify himself 
as the herald and announced that he was the Messiah and later baptized our Lord, he spoke of the sandals, implying that he was expecting a human successor. Right? He wouldn't say the straps of, of whose shoes I'm worthy to untie if our Messiah didn't have feet. This baptism of John, this baptism John speaks of contrasts with water bapt, contrasts his water baptism with the spirit baptism that the Messiah will accomplish. We can see that prophecy fulfilled in Acts 2 at Pentecost, where there's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Well, John the Baptist's hearers surely could have never anticipated all that Mark is about to write and what we'll be going through in the next few weeks. I'm sure that they knew in some way, shape, or form that there would be some sort of spiritual deluge poured out by God, which would purify the righteous and purge the wicked. Going back to Isaiah, for instance, in Isaiah 4, 4, it speaks of the day where the Lord will cleanse the bloodstains from Jerusalem by a spirit of judgment and fire. So what does all this have to do with me? We can learn from John. Our own lives and our own ministries should be focused on Jesus, whom we are not worthy to even stoop down and untie his sandal. Our lives shouldn't be focused on self-promotion or self-importance. John was a kinsman of our Lord. He was, he was a cousin. He was a prophet. God spoke to him, and he went out of his way to make sure that everyone knew, I'm just telling you about something that's even greater to come. He was the messenger, preparing the way, and had to deny that he was the Messiah. His ministry... His calling was to point to Christ. In 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25, the Apostle Paul says, For the word of cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God, not, has, God, has not God made foolishness the wisdom of the world? For since in the, wisdom, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For the Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to the Jews, and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than men. So we can preach Christ crucified, even if people don't get it, even if people think it's the craziest thing in the world. Because we see, we see that, that God... It, not to say that God is foolish in any way, shape, or form, not to say that God is not wise in any way, shape, or form, but the lowest estimation of God's wisdom, or just say that God is wise, God is wise, but the lowest estimation of God's wisdom is a thousand times more wise than anyone in the world, right? So we can preach Christ crucified because that's the power of God unto salvation. John the Baptist didn't care that you know, he, that he didn't really worry about how he, how he looked. He didn't worry about those things. His, his entire life was lived pointing people to Christ, telling people, you know, repent and believe. So is Christ central in your life? To borrow from the early 90s band DC Talk, do you care if people think that you're a Jesus freak? Does it matter that they think you're a fool when we know that the foolish, foolishness of God is wiser than men? Preach Christ crucified. Live a life of repentance. I'm not asking you to move to the forest and wear itchy clothes and eat locusts and wild blackberries. <laughs> Amen. But a humble life in submission to Christ is a good thing. And as humble servants of Christ, we serve a living Savior who has called us and will use us to accomplish his will and follow his promise. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your word, Lord. I thank you that, uh, that you would allow us to, to have an opportunity to repent, to live a life of humility, 
to, to point those around us in our work, in our school, in our communities to you. Lord, I pray that you would continue to humble us, that you would continue to lead us to repentance, that you would continue to allow us to, to grow in our faith and to share, to share the good news with the world who desperately, desperately needs it. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.